Welcome back to the News at 10. Obtaining a quality education is the foundation to improving people's lives and sustainable development. Quality education is also among the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Here in Nigeria, more than 25 million sit in public school classrooms. Will the 2020 education budget of the federal government improve the quality of education? A man with the answers, Babajide Gusunwu, is here with us tonight. Babajide, okay. Our crystal ball is back. Thanks for joining us. So public analysts have debated, and you know this, the advantages and disadvantages of the Almajiri system of education. And we saw that in the report. However, there's little or no controversy that education needs more funding. What do the facts about education reveal? You're right. Um, there's no controversy that education needs uh, more funding. But I would like us to start from a slightly different perspective. One of the founding fathers of the United States, um, Benjamin Franklin, he said that an investment in education pays the best interest. So tonight, let's look at how much interest are we earning on education. And to look at that, I would like us to look at the model of the United Kingdom. They have 8 million students, Amarachi. 8 million students in their public education system. Their government budgets 19 trillion naira annually. So for one moment, imagine that 19 trillion naira for just 8 million students. Let me make myself very clear. Here's what it means. It means what the United Kingdom budgets for one student mm. is what the Nigerian government budgets for 130 students. In other words, imagine one student in a classroom in the United Kingdom. What he gets from the United Kingdom's government mm. is what children sitting in five classrooms in Nigeria. That's a pretty get. bleak picture. And so clearly, education isn't paying so much interest in the lives of children. So the right question is, how do we get more funding mm. into education? And I think one way is for us to significantly consider or seriously consider launching our green bonds. Yeah, but, but where's... Or our education bonds, I mean. Yeah, but where's, where's much of the fund going into? Is it the primary, secondary, or the tertiary education? So let's um, take a look at where education... Um, look at the hearts of, of education in Nigeria. And if we're able to look at that carefully, you'll see that it is the primary school system. What do I mean? There are 22 million children in the public primary school system. That is taking a lot of money. Yeah. The second category is to look at those 10 million children that should be in school but are out of school. And so the government is also spending a lot of money to get children into school. And then we have 5 million students in public junior secondary schools. But we see that even before we get to the tertiary education, these three categories are the most important categories in our educational system. And that is the, the heart of, of funding. That is where most of the money is going to. And that is where most of the money will most likely continue to go to in the short to medium term. Well, you know, we hear the government talk about how important education is. I mean, the, this administration uh, started off with the school feeding program, you know, to encourage kids to stay in school. But, but I don't know if we're really seeing the impact of that. But if education is so important, why is it not prioritized as such? Because the government never really said it was going to be priority. Remember in 2015, the priority were three things corruption, the economy, and security. And even if you look at the most recent speech of the president on Independence Day, October 1st, mm. corruption had nine mentions. Security, seven mentions. Economy, five mentions. Education, one mention. And so the government still has its priority. Education is important, mm. do not get me wrong. However, the priority of the government in all of what it is doing is still corruption, to fight corruption, security, and the economy. So one of the other ways we could look at this is to look at how much funding is going into education, the priority of the government. And if we look carefully at that, what you, look, what you find and what it reveals is that in 2015, yeah. education got 11% of the federal government's national budget. Today, in the 2020 proposed budget, at 541 billion naira, education is only 5% of that budget. So looking at how much is being budgeted 
for education relative to the national budget, it also shows to us that education is important for this government. However, the priority of the government is still corruption, security, and the economy. And so we see much more money going into these areas, especially defense. Good for thoughts. But don't forget, in the final analysis, education, in the words of Benjamin Franklin, always pays the best interest. And so we expect that the government should increase funding that goes to education because that is where the future of Nigeria belongs. Abajide, thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. Always learn a great lot from you when you're here. Pleasure Thanks again. <laughs> now the people of Emakalakala community in Bielsa State are in dire straits over the lack of basic amenities, including portable water and medical care. It's a long-standing issue for which the residents are appealing for government intervention. Our community report tonight highlights the pressing needs of this community. This community, which is only about three kilometers from the Aloibri Oil Well 1 and requires about a 90-minute drive from Yenagoa, the Bayelsa state capital, was a sight to behold several years ago and now lies in ruins as most of the facilities in the community are dilapidated. The first site that welcomes you into this historic community after leaving the main road is the poorly cleared track that the people have to use as a path to various places. Then this dilapidated building, almost overgrown with weeds, with no doors or windows, and a ceiling that is slowly caving in. This building, which clearly looks abandoned, surprisingly served as a classroom for students, as the time stamps on the blackboard shows academic activities took place here only a few months ago. And maybe, if the teachers of government-owned schools in the state were not on strike, children of the community may still be here, learning. We are here to appeal to the government to help us, because the last exam to the, the right it here, and as you can see, no chairs, nothing, nothing. And uh, the school to the population has been reduced because of the level of uh, the neglect from the government. If you thought the site of the school is bad, then you may need to have a rethink, as the road path to the hospital is worse. This is what is left of the hospital, in ruins and no staff members as they've all been transferred. The hospital was closed down, something very unusual. Closed down the hospital and all the staff transferred to other hospitals. And when the government could not, still pay, could not pay the contract, the contractors, they all abandoned the hospital and that's what we are seeing now. The story is no different when it relates to the availability of portable water for the people. The community is rife with taps that don't work. This well and this river are the only source of water for the people of the community. No water, why we have boreholes that have been done before but all have been abandoned. So we are suffering from water from that time till now. We are facing water from uh, these uh, ponds and managing and from the river and the waters are not good for the health. The absence of these basic amenities has a worrisome effect, as Katrine Amos recounts how some pregnant women in the community have lost their lives during child labor due to the absence of a functional hospital. Since how many years ago, we don't get hospital again. Some women, and when they want to deliver, before they go rush the woman, go to clinic or hospital for another place, the woman go don't die, picking don't die. So hospital, now be the most important thing we will need. They are unanimous in their call for the Bielsa state government to come to their aid and provide any form of respite to make their living conditions better. Commuters plying the Oweri Onisha and Oweri Okigwe Federal Highway are calling on the federal government to, as a matter of urgency, begin work on the filled sections of the roads which have caused untold hardship on commuters and residents. According to them, the dilapidated state of the roads have not only become a death trap, 
but a hideout for armed robbers to carry out their evil acts at night. This is the present state of the Owerio Kigwe Federal Road, muddy with deep potholes and failed compartments. Heavy duty trucks and small vehicles equally have a hard time driving. The result through this is heavy traffic gridlock. And that is what commuters and transporters flying this route have to face on a daily basis. We have we've suffered. There is no day you you hit Imo State Road that you don't go for you don't go to mechanic. You must visit mechanic workshop and it will cost you a lot of money. It's even worse at the Uwere Onisha Federal Highway with blocked drain channels and riddled with potholes. For the transporters and car owners, the present state of the road is not in any way helpful to vehicles and residents of the area. But to roadside hawkers, it's a beehive of activity. The major problem there is drainage. If, some, if something will be done on it, the road will be good. Now what they have to do now is to see how to cut the road, put a very nice drainage across this road and channel it to one, one stream there. That will be the best thing they will do for this road and they, they will get it. The federal agency in charge of rehabilitating these roads, FIRMA, says it has commenced emergency repairs on some of the roads and will continue with other areas after the rainy season. I've tried engaging both the state governments and necessary authorities because of the problem we have there, even the local government's interim management committee. What we station we are by the outlets, water channel, I should take water off the road. There's a bus culvert there, and it's very close to that location. Uh, the station whereby they deliberately block up the outlets before using best known to them or trying to protect lands or something. Uh, we are constrained here. We have, we have tried to do some demolition sometime in the past to open up that area. We, we opened it up, we fixed that pavement, but the moment we go to block the outlets, the problem will come back. Commuters expect that when the rain finally subsides in a few weeks' time, the federal government will match words with action and fix these roads to reduce the hardship that they face daily while plying these roads. Some Christian worshippers are praying for an end to the prolonged feud between the Teve and Jukun tribes, as well as other crises in the Middle Belt region of the country. The prayers were offered during an event tagged Middle Belt Praise Festival featuring songs of praise by several gospel artists and worshippers from Teve and Jukung Extractions. In attendance was the Vice President, Professor Yemil Shibajo, who ministered in songs. African descendants from the United States, Brazil, Puerto Rico are tracing their lineage back to Nigeria. They performed a symbolic door of return ceremony through where slaves were first taken centuries ago. Nigeria's Diaspora Festival, an initiative of the Nigeria Diaspora Commission, celebrates the culture, history and heritage of people of African descent. <laughs> It is the third door of return ceremony, a cultural festival. Traditional rites, cultural dynamics, especially that of Badagri, the host community, in full display. 
Diaspora Commission says the essence is to build bridge of reconciliation for those retracing their roots back home. We're marking 400 years of slavery. And um, what we do is they walk through that path where our ancestors were taken away as slaves. You know, it's a very emotional, it's mind blowing actually. So now we now receive them through the door of return. We were taken away through the point of no return. They feel what our ancestors felt. They return through the door of return like kings and queens. Imagine the agony they went through. And of course, a lot of them died in that process oh and were thrown into the sea. Oh but the see, story of pains and agonies many went through to during the era of slave trade evoked some emotions. Buy or get an African uh, the two-day event also had the full print ceremony signifying the return of the descendants. It is a blessing to be here. The delegation of men and women in the diaspora say coming home helps them heal their sense of identity and history. It was an opportunity to walk the path that the slaves walked and to even touch the water that they went into. We blessed, blessed the land, we blessed the water, we anointed it, and we're praying that God will allow many others from the diaspora to come back uh, so that we can build a connection and build a bridge between the continent and the diaspora. They brought Nigerians to work the gold mines. And so I knew from our music growing up, from our festivals, that we were tied to this great nation. But it wasn't until last year when I took a DNA test, it determines where your ancestry is from, from your blood, that I am 9.4% Nigerian. Estranged from their homelands many years ago, there are millions of people identifying themselves as Africans, but currently live far from the continent. The initiative, according to the organizers, is to unify the people and uplift the continent. Still ahead of the news at 10, Manchester United and Liverpool's 100% start to the English Premier League season and their 17-match winning streak. We'll have more on sports news. Please stay with us.